Welcome. Great to be with you again. Today we're going to do a character study about Isaac. Now Isaac is someone who's a bit more laid back, a bit more passive, and he doesn't have quite as prominent a role as either his father Abraham or his son Jacob. The same thing is true in the book of Hebrews 11. He is mentioned in the Hall of Fame of the Faithful, uh, but he, he's given basically one verse uh, in between the accounts of Abraham and Jacob. But what we can what can we learn from Isaac? What can we learn from his strengths, from his weaknesses, and what lessons can we get from his life that we can apply to ours today? Now, I believe that every single part of the Bible is relevant, and all of the accounts of these men and women who lived even thousands of years ago can teach us many things about God and can teach us even how to live our life now in the, 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 in the 21st century. So I'd invite you to join with us as we do this character study of Isaac and let's see what God is going to teach us. So first we're going to read the verse from Hebrews eleven twenty. 20. We are doing a study of Hebrews 11 and studying these different characters inside of Hebrews 11 as we go through. And it says, by faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. So it has one verse about Isaac there. It mentions him before this um, as being the heir of the promise, uh, the child of promise given to Sarah and Abraham. Now before we get into it, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you for showing us the lives of men and women, biblical heroes of the faith who lived many, many years ago because from their lives, we can learn many things about you and about your plan. We see that they were flesh and blood like we are. They had weaknesses and struggles and temptations like we do, but yet they also had faith. And we see you um, as their Lord and you uh, as their a savior and you as their guide and you are the one lord who gives them grace and we thank you for the grace that we can receive from you we ask that the holy spirit would be with us as we study now give us understanding and insight and give us the will to obey lord any lessons which we learn we pray these things in jesus name amen so a character study will be a little different from our typical verse by verse bible studies uh, first we'll give a bit of a background about isaac uh, his vocation, his place in history, his family life. Then we will come into his weaknesses and his strengths and then lessons we can learn from those which we can apply to our life today. Now, the name Isaac means laughter. Uh, this takes on new meaning when you consider the background of when Isaac was born. Now, first of all, um, his mother Sarah laughs in mockery that she would ever be able to have a son in her old age. So from this angle, calling her son laughter uh, could serve as a daily reminder that nothing is too difficult from God, for God. I was laughing at even the possibility of having a child and then later she would be laughing because this ludicrous idea that she could have a child at her old age came true. And so it's not a laughter of mockery anymore, but it was a laughter of happiness, joy, praise, and thanksgiving. So I find his name, Isaac, meaning laughter, is very, very ironic when you consider the history um, behind uh, his birth. Now, Isaac was the 11th generation from Noah, descended from Shem. His grandfather was Terah and his father Abraham. Now, in Joshua 24, 2, it lets us know that his ancestors were not followers of the one true God but then Abraham was. So Abraham's faith was unique uh, to that family. He had one older half-brother, Ishmael, and eventually several other younger half-brothers, which Abraham had after Sarah's death. Now, Isaac primarily lived in the land of Canaan. Uh, he lived as a sojourner, moving around often. That was necessary for feeding his large herds. Uh, he lived near a region that was controlled by the Philistines, showing their influence dated back well before the time of David. Now, at this time in world history, there were very few followers of the one true God. Polytheism was the practice of the day. There were many different false gods and idols, many superstitions in the land where he lived. So Abraham, uh, Abraham and then Isaac's faith in the one true God really, really stands out. Now, how was he born? The events surrounding his birth are very important. 
We see these in Genesis 21, 1 through 7. Really, you'd have to read several chapters of Genesis to get the full idea. We don't have time for that today. But from verse 1, it says, The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. So he had promised this at least 10 years before, uh, maybe even as much as 15 years or more before, God had promised that Sarah and Abraham would have a son. And this happened as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son, who was born to him, whom, I, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac, or laughter. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old. And so verse 6 says, Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And interestingly, if you go back, um, in Hebrews 11, verse 12, I think this phrase is so funny. It says, therefore, from one man in him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven. That, that one man is Abraham. It's saying when Abraham had, had Isaac, he was as good as dead. He was that old. But God gave him descendants. So God can do everything. So, Isaac's birth is probably the second most amazing in the Bible, perhaps in the history of the world. Second, of course, to Jesus' virgin birth. His mother was 90, Abraham was 100. His birth was the fulfillment of a promise God had made to Abraham roughly 20, maybe up to 20 years before, showing that if we wait for God in faith, he will always keep his promises. Nothing is too difficult for him. So, Genesis is really a story of God's faithfulness in keeping his promise. He kept his promise to Abraham. He would keep his promises to Abraham's descendants as well. God promised that Abraham would have a great nation um, and that they would live in and have the promised land, Canaan. And from the time of the Romans in 70 AD when uh, Titus came and beat them up and exiled them around the world, Israel didn't have their homeland. But then in the 1940s, they came back again after World War II and form their homeland. So God's promise was kept to the Jews even across thousands of years. Most people, when they scatter around the world, they will be assimilated into other countries, but not the Jews. They still maintained their identity. They still maintained their religion. And finally, they came back after a long, long time. So nothing is too difficult for him. All right. So that's about his birth. What was his occupation and his training? Genesis 26, 12, it says, Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. The man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. Okay, so they planted, uh, he planted crops, raised flocks of animals. Um, some speculate that Abraham was at one point a trader or a businessman. We see that Isaac inherited his wealth and he too was very, very wealthy. Uh, he would have inherited his family's business. Now, Isaac was also a patriarch of the Jewish people. He was one of the first post-flood committed followers of the one true God. Now, Isaac serves as a type of Christ. Abraham received him back from the dead as a type of Christ's future resurrection. So that is meant to foreshadow Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, Isaac didn't actually die, but it was as if he was going to die, and then God miraculously saved him. And that points to Jesus' death and then Jesus' resurrection. Now, he and Jesus were both only um, sons from their mother. Um, well, Jesus is the only begotten son of God, and then Isaac is the only son of Sarah and Abraham. They were both sons of promise. They're both descended from Abraham. They both carried the wood for their sacrifice. They're both obedient to their father's will. You don't see Isaac running away when his father's going to sacrifice him. They're both obedient even to the point of being willing to die. They're both delivered and saved by the power of God. So Isaac is often called a type of Christ. Isaac points us to Jesus and there are some similarities between their lives. Now let's consider some of Isaac's weaknesses, and we don't do this because we want to bash him or we want to say we are better than him, but he is a man. He's flesh and blood like we are, and we can learn from these weaknesses and mistakes. We can learn of God's grace and forgiveness, and we can also be encouraged to not make the same mistakes that he did 
We can learn from those mistakes so we do not have to repeat them. Genesis 25, 28 says, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So what is the weakness here? Well, it's favoritism. They both made this mistake of showing favoritism to their children. Isaac liked Esau better. Rebekah liked Jacob better. Well, it seems Isaac liked Esau better because he had more in common with Esau. And Rebekah liked Jacob better because she had more in common with him. And later it tells us that Jacob was like a, a man of the house. He liked sticking around the house. Esau liked going outside. So favoritism. Is favoritism good or bad? Now your children might accuse you of favoritism sometimes saying, oh, you're, you're unfair. You favor that one instead of me. Uh, hopefully those accusations are not genuine because favoritism can be very, very damaging to the father-child relationship. And favoritism can cause a lot of conflicts between the siblings, as we see in the case of Jacob and Esau. Um, it caused a lot of bitterness, resentment. It doesn't bring about unity in the family. Instead, it brings about factions and divisions as the two sides or multiple sides disagree and argue and have conflicts together. Okay, so there's a lesson from this. We need to be very, very careful not to show favoritism. That applies to teachers. Don't have teacher's pet. That applies to bosses. Don't have your favorite employee whom you give special treatment to. That applies to parents. Don't show favoritism to your children. Be fair. Be equitable. Love them all and show that love to all of them so that none of them feel like they are the odd one out. Um, this favoritism resulted in a lot of problems for their family. Now, we can probably say that Isaac was primarily responsible for favoritism in the family. He was the head of the household. He was the husband. He should have been the one to put a stop to it and to treat both of his sons equally and to ask Rebecca to do the same. But he didn't. So that was one weakness. Uh, Genesis 26. <clears throat> this is a case of like father, like son. If you checked out our last videos about Abraham who claimed that Sarah was his sister, um, in order to basically protect his own skin because he was afraid that the leader of the land he was sojourning in would kill him and then take Sarah as his wife. Now, in this chapter 26, Isaac does the same thing. And let me see the verse. It is in, I, uh, not, it's not in the book of Isaac. There isn't one. It's in Genesis 26, verse 7. It says, When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister. For he feared to say, My wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. So the saying, like father, like son, is very often true. Now, I believe that Abraham probably would have even taught Isaac about this story and maybe even told him this wasn't good and it wasn't right. It seems very unlikely that Abraham would have told Isaac, you should do this because both of those th times ended in disaster and God had to save his back. It's clearly a mistake. If Isaac did know of these examples, they appear to be before he was born, it's likely that he knew of them as examples of this is what you should not do. Let this be a lesson to you. Like Father Bear and the Berenstein Bears who rides his bicycle and says, don't do it like this, don't do it like that. So if he knew of Abraham doing that, then it probably was this type of example, although we don't have absolute proof of that. But it begs the question, why did Isaac make the same mistake? What do you think? The most likely answer to me is that this was a cultural practice at that time. Perhaps husbands occasionally referred to their wives as sisters in order to protect themselves and their own skin. Certainly lying was a common part of culture. <clears throat> Yet at this time, the lie reveals a deeper character flaw. The flaw is that Abraham and Isaac were valuing themselves higher than their wives. And that is something that was true of that culture is that men often treated women as inferior or as less than themselves. They shouldn't have done that. It seems they were willing for their wives to suffer if it meant they wouldn't. They're willing to put their wives in danger if it meant they would be safe. Now, here's a lesson for all of the current or future husbands out there. Never do this. As a leader of your family, you should serve. You should be the one taking the risk and the danger onto yourself 
not putting it onto your wife. That is not a good example of leadership. It's an example of authoritarianism or protecting your own skin. Put your own neck, reputation, and safety on the line, not hers. Um, so in this case, uh, God also protected them. Abimelech looked out and he saw Isaac laughing with Rebecca, his wife, and he realized, okay, you're not, you know, that's not your sister. Um, you're clearly not treating her as you would a sister. That's your wife. And so he says, why, why would you lie? <clears throat> so God, in his sovereign providence, protected Isaac from a situation that could have ended up very, very badly and even jeopardized God's promise um, to him and to their descendants. Now, of course, God's in control and God keeps his promises. Okay, now there's another weakness of Isaac. And this is not one verse, but it's really a chapter in Genesis 27. In this chapter, this is the chapter where um, Jacob comes in and deceives uh, Isaac and gets the blessing instead of uh, Esau. And Esau then wants to kill Jacob. And Rebecca is, um, you know, pushing Jacob along, saying it's okay, do it. And so you, what you see is a very dysfunctional household. Uh, there's a lot of manipulation, bitterness, scheming together to get Isaac's blessing. Um, Esau uh, was very upset and wants to kill Jacob. And then when this plan is known, again, it's Rebecca coming up with the solution. She says, let's send Jacob back to his family. And so she's manipulating in that. Isaac seems to be in the dark about a lot of things going on in his house. And it's not just because he's physically blind at this point. Rebecca, Jacob, and Esau all are taking turns running the show while he is reduced to the role of spectator. Now, in the Bible, the role of husband is that of head of the family, uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Now, some women say, okay, well, my husband's the head, but I'll be the neck and I'm going to turn the head wherever I want it to. Um, that's not really the biblical idea that, that we get. And so in the case of Isaac and Rebecca, it seemed maybe that's how their marriage was operating. Rebecca was like the neck and, and turning Isaac and kind of manipulating him to get the outcome which she wanted. But he doesn't really show strong leadership in solving these problems. He basically failed to some extent raising his sons. Um, Esau completely abandons the faith as shown by his marriage to the Canaanites. Jacob is a believer in name for a lot of his life, but only finally commits to God much later in his life. Um, so it's a picture of someone who's not really fully leading the household well as he is supposed to. So for all the men out there, um, be men. And that doesn't mean be bossy or a dictator, but it means know what's going on in your household. Ask, you know, communicate with your family members, your, your spouse and your children and understand what's going on in their lives and understand the situations and the difficulties they're going through. Try to make sure that there aren't any divisions between siblings or any conflicts, but try to help those be resolved and resolved quickly before they fester and uh, really rip apart the family. So know what's going on in your family, communicate, and be a servant to practice servant leadership in your family. You can think about your own family and how you can do that. Sometimes it just starts with some conversations. Talk more. Uh, guys often don't like talking, right? We just do our thing and we aren't big on sharing or talking, but a lot of times we just need to talk more. Talk to your wife, talk to your children, and understand what they are facing. Now, Isaac also has a number of strengths, and so we should not forget those. We've looked at some of his weaknesses. Now, this is Genesis 22. <clears throat> it is the example of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Uh, God told him, that is Abraham, in Genesis 22, 2, he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering. Okay, and then uh, Abraham takes Isaac, and they cut wood. And they go, um, and this whole time, uh, it even says in verse 6 of Genesis 22 that he laid the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac, his son. Now, in all of this situation, um, Isaac is going along with it. He's following him, even to the very end, even to the point of laying down on the altar and allowing himself to be bound there. Isaac is an obedient child. 
At no point in the story does he run away, does he throw a timber tantrum, he obeys his father, he even helps carry the wood again. Probably didn't know he's going to be sacrificed until they arrived and his father tied him up, but even at that point, we don't see any resistance. He likely trusted his father implicitly. And so from this point, he is foreshadowing Christ, who is totally obedient to his father and gives up his own will in order to follow his father's will. And he says, not my will be done, but yours. Okay, that's one example. Now, here's another one of his strengths. We saw he's obedient. And we also see he is patient. And he was patient to wait for a spouse. Now, Genesis 24, uh, Abraham sends a servant uh, to go and find a spouse for Isaac. And we see what Isaac was doing in verse 63 while all this was going on. It says, Isaac went out to the to meditate in the field toward evening. He lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And then he saw Rebekah. And then um, they went forward and ended up uh, in marriage. So in this situation of his marriage, he didn't take things into his own hands. He surely knew of Abraham's plan to provide a wife for him, and he obeyed it implicitly. He submitted to his father's plan because he trusted his father and he thought, this will be good for me. Rebecca was not a perfect woman. No woman is. But we can see she has good character. She has a servant's heart. She has faith in God. And she has a submissive attitude. So Isaac also was submissive. He was submissive to his father's plan. He was submissive to God's plan. Um, when you think of like Esau, would Esau have waited and just gone, gone along with this arranged marriage? Um, very likely not. In fact, he went to find wives of his own and they weren't good wives. They were Canaanites. But Isaac is patient and submissive. And so that is good example. So let us not lean on our own understanding, take things into our own hands, and then try to achieve what we want through our own way. Instead, let us patiently wait for the Lord, his plan, and his timing. All right. Another strength is faith. And there are a lot of places we can see this in Isaac's life, but let's look at Genesis. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Genesis 26, 3 through 5. It says, Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and will give to your offspring all these lands. In your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And then if we go down to Genesis 26, verse 35, uh, maybe that's the wrong verse um, there. But Abra uh, Isaac carried in faith towards God even after Abraham died. Um, he built altars to God. Uh, he gave God the glory. Ah, here's the one I want to look at. Genesis 26, 22. He says, Now the Lord has made room for us. We shall be fruitful in the land. So he made altars to God. He worshiped God. He gave God glory. And he had faith. He was a real believer in the one true God. So it's easy to focus on some of Isaac's weaknesses. We should remember all people are sinners. We are too. Imagine yourself in Isaac's place. Imagine living at a time when there were virtually no followers of Yahweh. He's surrounded by idol worship, pagan practices, false deities, and evil. There's no church or fellowship for him to attend. No Bible yet with a clear guide on what you should or shouldn't do. He faced all these challenges and he still followed God. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that, he's, that he never once worshipped any idols in his life. Um, Jacob had some issue with idols at some point. But Isaac, even at a time when all the people in the culture around him were worshipping idols, he was not. Okay, one more um, example from the life of Isaac. This is <clears throat> Genesis 26, <clears throat> 12 through 22. Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him. The man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. 
Isaac is a peacemaker. He doesn't argue. He does it. It says, so Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that also, so he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us. We shall be fruitful in the land. Okay, so the Philistines tell Isaac to go, and he goes. Then he digs the wells. These are wells which they filled up, which Abraham had dug. And Isaac digs them out again, and the Philistines come along like, oh, nice well, that's ours, we want it, we built that. And Isaac's like, uh, well, he lets them have it, and he goes away, he doesn't fight. And then the second well that he and his men dug, the Philistines come along, yep, we want that too, that's ours, it's on our land, we get it. And Isaac let them have it. He didn't fight. He chose a more peaceful course. And then the third time he went away and dug a well. And then they let it go and they didn't come the third time. What can we learn from Isaac? Well, the same quality that makes him sometimes a bit passive, in this case, makes him patient and a peacemaker. So sometimes we have character qualities that are a pro and a con. In some situations, they're pro. Maybe in some situations, they're a con. Um, Isaac was a peacemaker, and that is a great strength. He didn't get hot-headed and quarrel and fight with the Philistines. And maybe he and his servants and some of them would have died. It, it really wasn't necessary to die over this. I mean, water was very, very important at that time in history to have a well, but not so important that Isaac was willing to risk the lives of his men about. And he didn't do things rashly. He wasn't prideful. He didn't fight or demand, this is my well and my rights are going to be satisfied. He just saw a simpler and more peaceful course. Okay, I'll go over there and build another one. And then I'll do, go over there and build another one again. So very good example of being a peacemaker. What about you? Are you willing to give up your rights for the sake of others? Are you willing to give up something which by all rights should be yours, but you give it up in order to be a peacemaker? In this world, I think it's all too common for us to just pridefully stand our ground and say, this is my right. Especially in Western society, we are very, very concerned with our personal rights. And that's nice. It's wonderful that we have those. But yet, God doesn't call us to hold on all the time to our rights. He calls us to be unselfish, to put others first, and to be, if possible, at peace um, with the others around us. So we need to use God's wisdom to know when is the right time to stand up and when is the right time to compromise and, and let things go. And I trust that the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom in that. So this is a bit about the life of Isaac, uh, some of his weaknesses and some of his strengths and what we can learn from those. I hope that we will learn to be a peacemaker, to have faith in God, to be patient, to be obedient to God's call in our life and to avoid favoritism, um, to avoid putting our interests over the interests of others, and to be uh, for men that we wouldn't be a weak leader and not know what is going on in our own family. And let us remember too that Isaac was a child of promise. He wasn't perfect, but God gave his promise to him. God covered him in grace, and God will give us his grace as well, even when we are weak and imperfect. I hope that this lesson was encouraging for you. I would invite you to join us again next time. We'll continue some more character studies as we go through the book of Hebrews 11. Uh, now, if you like character studies, we have a character studies book, a Bible study guide on our website. Um, it's called, well, basically just called character studies, and it has a number of different character studies on Abraham and different uh, men and women of the faith. You can study these on your own or in small groups. I would invite you to like and subscribe. That way you can keep up to date about our latest Bible study videos. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and I hope to see you again. God bless.